standards. Our year's story of the Salcombe lifeboat crew is drawing to a close. It's Remembrance Sunday, and the townspeople gather to salute those who died for their country and their town. Wait! Halt! Let us pray. Eternal God and loving Father, we remember before you this day all those who made the supreme sacrifice who laid down their lives on land, at sea, and in the air. We pray for all who suffer as the result of For Lucy, of Brian, Roger, and the rest of the crew, there's not only war to ponder, but other disasters which have taken the town's best, like the loss of the lifeboat back in 1916. Amen. The names of the 13 men who drowned that day are also on the war memorial. They capsized in the raging water on Salcombe's treacherous sandbar, only yards from safety. Older people in Salcombe can still tell a tale about that, like Les Stone and Bill Budget, a former lifeboat secretary. Les has a particular reason to look back on that day. My father was a member of the crew, and he was actually sat in the boat on the slip there. And his pal, called Wood, I think it was called Arthur Wood, said to father, he said, you get out. He said, you just got yourself married, and I'll go in your place, you see? So the poor devil, he got drowned, and uh, father survived. But it's rather tragic when you think that those poor fellas launched off that slip, rolled all the way to Stark Point, and it was a false alarm. Mm. And then they got back here, back home, and just over there, she turns end over end. And they all drown except two. But uh, devastating. Uh, yes, I think, well, it's the same thing with all lifeboat disasters, mind. You, you get it. Yeah. Well, especially when you, which they are normally small communities. Yeah. So that's everybody right. knows everybody. That's right. Yeah. And obviously, a, uh, any lifeboat man is all is going to be known extremely well by all the town. That's, that's right. So yeah. the loss of a whole crew together is a fearful, shattering thing to a town. Yeah. Terrible. Right. Manage. Yeah, I think so, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, that's right. a rough day. That must have been a frightening sight. When you think that the boat was in this place yeah. and the fellas had to get in her, lapsed off there, down across the beach, with the paddles up in the air yes. until they were launched. <laughs> Trouble is, in spring tides and times like that, it would have been a terrible row before they ever started. Yeah. yeah. With the spring tide running up there. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, the sea. Is it a the sea? Thing? Can't beat the sea, you never will. It's unpredictable, and even, you know, out in a lifeboat, there is that monster sea that you don't expect. He just arrives, and you don't know what he's going to do to you. He can capsize you or turn you end to end. Um, and the, cap the, the coxswain has really got to be on the board. He, he just dare not take his eyes off what's in front of him. Stunned by the disaster, the townsfolk met in its aftermath to see if they still have the stomach to raise another crew. They did, and 75 years on, they're still here. Of course, the boat has changed out of all recognition. Now it's packed with the latest technological wizardry. So unlike the old days, the crew must train constantly. Exercises like this one with the fire brigade go on even through the long winter when there's no real action. But then, as now, it all comes down to the people, not the machinery. That's what unites today's crew with the past.
Roger Evans is one of the longest serving members, a company director who comes back to Salcombe every weekend to work on the boat. He's been with Cox and Frank Smith for 18 years now, through all the ups and downs. We end up showing people that life boating is a very mundane sort of job. Polishing brass, cleaning decks, being nagged at. It's just like being married, life boating. He does the nagging. All sorts of people. That's a winter, nothing in the harbour, Frank. Yeah. Soon goes, done that. Yeah, certainly does. Quite his time for the, the boat. You can't tell, can you? I, I think the last time you said that, we were at sea within a few hours. You just don't know. You never know. Because it's, you know, there's no yacht traffic now, and you just hope that nobody commercial gets into trouble, basically. But you've still got the yachts on passage in one thing and another going up and down, you know, so. They are still about. Frank cares, and I mean, I think you've, you've been here long enough to know that, you know, that's all he does care about. And I think if there's a choice between the boat and other important things in his life, he'll always put the boat first. And I don't think he understands people that don't care the same way about it as he does. I mean, you could say it's a fetish, but. Um, I think that, you know, he really does care so much about it. And he's part of the old lifeboat. We talked about this before. You know, the Frank's replacement won't be like Frank. Is he the last of an old guard? He's last of an old guard, yes. There'd be few, a few exceptions, you know, but you know, it's, a it's a different relationship. I mean, maybe some of the crew look at the lifeboat as a, uh, just another, Position like a motor car or a lorry or a tool. Whereas for Frank, it's a lot more than that. It's him, extension of his life. Not everyone can meet such exacting standards. At the boathouse, Marks with the lifeboat secretary, Peter Hodges. Reluctantly, Marks decided to stand down as assistant mechanic to spend more time with Alicia and Lauren. Whoa! You ready? Let's go. Oh, hello, monster, how are you? Alicia is not sure it's the right decision. One, two, three, four, five, down, whoa! It affects him more than it does me, so with him giving it up, I think he'll feel a loss emotionally inside as well, although he's gaining on his family side. But when the pager goes off, I know that his mind is going to be racing and thinking, you know, to go. Well, I'll still be going. When the pager goes off, I'll still be going. I mean, I'll go to a show, but what it means is I won't have to, I won't have to be going, getting Every up show. on an early Sunday morning. I mean, we've never had a lie-in on a Sunday. We've never had it, ever. We've never... I've always got up at been out of the house by 9 o'clock, haven't I, on a Sunday? Mm. And my other day off on a Monday, I've been out of the house by 7. If I want to go and put petrol in the car, if I wanted to go out now and put a gallon of petrol in the car, I would have to actually make telephone calls to people because I would be more than three minutes away from the, from the station. And that, after a while, becomes very prohibitive, indeed. Especially if you're running a business and you've got a young family. No, but how are you going to feel when the, when the beaver goes off and you run around to the station and you're not one that's picked? Well, very upset. Well, yeah. But you can't... But you could, yeah, that's a purely on a selfish selfish basis. I mean, as, as long as the boat... I'd be more upset if there wasn't enough crew turned up. It's a bitter afternoon with a Force 8 gale gusting in from the Atlantic. Not a day to be out at sea. What is it, Frank? Oh, I got a yacht that wants escorting over the bar, so... Nothing really major, urgent, but we got to go. Sitting there all afternoon, waiting for this to happen. Yeah. You're, are you doing the radio? We'll take it. 
The sea is breaking badly over the sandbar, just as it was when the lifeboat went down in 1916. The yacht has tried to get in, but almost capsized and turned back out again. I don't want that door open under any account. I'll check the All right. Yeah. It's bloody shallow here now, isn't it? The gale has turned the harbour mouth into a seething stretch of water. They're in for a rough ride. Hold tight, you guys. Hold tight. You have to hang on, you lot, for a minute. Let me see your in time. Frank's plan is to go out and meet the yacht and then guide her back across the sandbar. We're in the search area now. Call her up, say he likes to follow us. Right, as quick as you can out, shut the door. Frank radios the yacht instructions to follow closely behind him into the harbour mouth. Tense moments now as they approach the bar. Few know these unpredictable waters as well as Frank, but the yacht could be turned over at any time. Frank pours storm oil on the surface, hoping to take some of the violence out of the waves. They've reached the bar. This is it. All Frank and the crew can do now is watch as the yacht threads through the waves which have undone so many boats in the past. They've done it. They're through. They've crossed the bar. A few minutes later, they're inside the safe haven of Salcombe Harbour, and it's another job well done. There'll be no celebration drink today, though. At the shipwrights, the curtains are drawn and the door closed. Colin and Kim have finally decided they can't pay their way and have called it a day. It's the end of an era for us. Um, we put everything into it, heart and soul, for the last five and a half, six years. Um, unfortunately, that's the end of Kim and myself in the shipwrights. Uh, if there was a fairy at the top of the Christmas tree that could may, may wave a magic wand, then we'd stay here forever. But uh, those things only happen in films, and unfortunately, we've we've had to close, so. Will you leave Silken? I don't honestly know on that. That's an unknown quantity. I don't know where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do. Um, that, I don't know. That's, that's in the future. Have you ever been out of work before, Paul? Uh, for two days. Uh, I left the Navy on the 9th of, November, 9th of February 1987 and I was homeless and unemployed for two days until we moved into the shipwrights on the 11th. Uh, so no, I haven't. I've uh, always, always had a job, uh, always had a future. We've still got a future. It's unknown, uncertain. And, what future? But uh, who knows? It's a lot of hard work gone down the drain, really.
And Colin's not the only member of the crew hit by the latest squalls in the recession. Lucy, too, faces a chill winter. Well, things aren't going too well at the moment. I've recently lost my job because it's gone so quiet at the garage, so I'm unemployed. Um, it, well, it's so quiet in Sulcombe that there's just there's no work around. I've been looking in the job centres and through the papers, and there's nothing available at the moment. And Mum's not working as well, so we put our house up for sale last week. That's a bit of a, a blow. Yeah, it's not very nice, but it's, I suppose it's one of those things at the moment. Lots of other people are probably in a worse position than we are. I didn't expect it to happen so soon. I thought I'd have a job maybe through the winter and it'd probably be laid off sort of uh, end of January, but it has gone so quiet that they just don't need me anymore. Never mind, at least I haven't got to wear those awful overalls. <laughs> I mean, is this it's the end of your first year on the lifeboat? How do you feel about that? How do you think it's gone well? And... It hasn't gone too bad being on the lifeboat, although I've missed a few shouts in the summer because I couldn't get down from Marlborough quick enough. But now I'm in Sulcombe all the time, I'll be able to make all of them. It's almost Christmas, the end of our 12 months with the Salkham crew. And even now, they're all out on the streets helping to raise money for the lifeboat. All, that is, except for Colin and Kim. For the last few days, they've been packing up their belongings. Colin's been unable to find a job here in the town, so they're leaving Sulcombe for good. People have been terrific, and, and we just feel sorry that we had to leave. But it's not our choice, but it's one of those things. You've taken it very bravely. No, I'm not very brave, not at all. It's a <clears throat> not so. Colin's been forced to take a job in Abu Dhabi. They'll have no need of a lifeboatman's skills there. Do you want me to say thank you to Father Christmas for you? Thank you. Yes! It's very big, isn't it? It's Christmas Day morning, and Frank's still on duty. He's out checking the sea conditions before taking the family to Mark's for Christmas dinner. <coughs> you ever been out on Christmas, Frank? Yeah, two years ago we were out. I passed one. 13.30 we went. I suppose you were in the middle of your dinner, were you? No, we were just about to start. Yeah, so, well, so by scale it was. Horrible. For a windsurfer. There's usually about five or six lifeboats out on Christmas Day, you see, throughout the country. Good morning. Good morning, Bree. Merry, Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> kiss, kiss. Oh, not just yet. <laughs> good wine, good food, and good company. Right, here we go. Someone stole my would anybody like some wine? I can have that one. I don't want that one. <laughs> some red wine. Where's Frank sitting? Is he just there? Yeah, this is all over, Frank. Oh, bloody nightmare, isn't it? It's a bit easier to go to sea, isn't it? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> 
You didn't get annoyed with that poor windsurfer, though, Frank, did you? No, 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 no. We never get annoyed, Graham. That's what we're here for. I think just before we start, we should say grace. So, for what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Amen. of Salkan have maintained their lifeboat for 130 years now and through all the usual crises of life the crew goes on all of it made possible by volunteers giving their time their money and their efforts Sometimes these days we're told there's no longer such a thing as society. But here's a group of people who have banded together, shelving their differences for the good of others. Ordinary people who do an extraordinary job. is a quality hard to define, easier perhaps to lose. It's what used to be called the best of British. 